I am Janine Kickert of the Lafayette Historical Society Oral History Project, talking with George Watson. My son Patrick will assist with this interview. Today is July 22, 2013. Let's start with your full name and please spell it and where were you born? Okay. Well, do you want my middle name as well? But that would be good. It's George, I think you know how to spell George, G-E-O-R-G-E, -E, Wingate, W-I-N-G-A-T-E, mm -hmm. Wasson, W-A-S-S-O-N, and my birth date is September 21, 1923. You're proud of being your age, aren't you? And you should be. <laughs> uh, who and where were your parents? And... Um, what is their background, George? Well, uh, first of all, I was born in Schenectady, New York. Um, my father is a Purdue graduate, graduated from Purdue in 19, er, yeah, 1913, mm -hmm. and uh, he took a job with General Electric, which is in Schenectady, New York. My mother is a Vassar graduate, mm -hmm. and she was born in Brooklyn. In fact, my father was, first of all, was born in Hope, Indiana. And I think it was 1889 or something like that. Uh, my mother was uh, born in Brooklyn, New York, in um, 1895. And then uh, she eventually uh, went to Vassar College and graduated in 1917 and took a job with General Electric in Schenectady, New York. And that's where the two of them met. She actually was with several other Vassar graduates who were, quote, the first lady engineers that went to work for General Electric. Now, they really were not engineers, but, <laughs> but they were hired in to do engineering-type work. And so anyway, they met and um, were married sometime, I guess, about, oh, maybe uh, 19, 19 or 1920. My father had been in World War One. And after that, uh, came back to again to Schenectady, and they got married. Soon after that, or in an appropriate amount of time, my brother was born in 1922, and I was born in 1923, and my sister was born in 1924. So my mother always said she was pretty busy raising children, having three kids in diapers all at the same time. <laughs> Well, then we moved from uh, Schenectady, New York, down to Philadelphia, where General Electric had another plant. My father worked uh, there in the engineering department. And um, then I lived there until it seemed like it was forever and ever. But uh, I went through all the grammar schools and high schools and everything. Graduated from high school in 1941 and uh, went off to Purdue, and I was there in September of, or December of 1941 when we had that uh, incident in Pearl Harbor, <laughs> and I figured I was not ever going to finish up before I'd be drafted, so I dropped out of Purdue in the first, after the first semester, and went to work for a while, and then eventually I went to work for General Electric to begin with, and uh, then the draft came along and I went into the Navy and was fortunate enough in the programs that were available to get into what was called Radio Materiel School, which was the school which taught you how to take care and, and repair radar. And so it was a little bit ahead of, of the times. And eventually I got assigned to, a, well, first of all, in that program, there was one six-month course, which was uh, in California, and I figured I was never going to get any place east of the, or west of the of the Mississippi. So I decided, rather than go to Bethesda, Maryland, or Houston, Texas, or Chicago, I decided I would go to Treasure Island in San Francisco. So I was here for actually seven months, and. Uh, Having gotten to Treasure Island and then finished up in the rest of the Navy things, I figured there wasn't any other place in the world to live. <laughs> so eventually I 
Well, after the war, I got got back to Purdue and finished my uh, degree in electrical engineering, and uh, then decided to go to law school. And I, the company wanted to hire somebody who was an engineer, who knew something about electronics. And it was in Detroit, and so I went to Detroit, where I went to law school, and eventually met my wife, who lived in. I was living with a group of bachelors and. Her family lived just behind us in another street, and we were married in 1952. And she says that I never told her that I was going to come to California, but uh, I did. I'm sure I told her from the very beginning. <laughs> anyway, uh, we moved to uh, California in 1957, and fortunately her aunt and uncle lived in Oakland, she had a sister who was married out here and lived in Pleasant Hill, and so we were fortunate enough to find a home in Lafayette and halfway in between Pleasant Hill and Oakland, and so it was a happy relationship. <laughs> so that got me to California and to Lafayette, and in the course of time we had three children. Two were born in Detroit, and uh, one was born out here in California. Then uh, after that, uh, I, uh, my church background was with an Episcopal church in the East Coast, and they were proposing to build a new Episcopal church in Lafayette. And so I got involved with it. It's the St. Anselm's, which is on Michael Lane, and our home was on Michael Lane, the one that we bought. Mm -hmm. And so I got active with them. And in the course of uh, several discussions over whatever meetings and so forth. I met one guy who we got talking about things that were going on in Lafayette. And Lafayette was then beginning to talk about incorporating. It was still an unincorporated area of the Contra Costa County. And he had been very active with the Lafayette Improvement Association. And so he said, well, I think, I think you ought to get into the Lafayette Improvement Association. So I joined them and was active in that for a whole bunch of years, <clears throat> eventually became president of that. And then the city of Lafayette, or the group in, the, in Lafayette, was talking about incorporating as a city, and the Improvement Association was involved with that, and I got involved with that as well. And I was a candidate for city council the first on the first vote. I didn't win <laughs> that one. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, became a candidate in another set of, of opportunities and eventually was elected to uh, the city council in Lafayette uh, after the city had been formed by that time. And I was elected in uh, 1974. <coughs> eventually became the mayor in 1976. And I always say, people ask, when were you mayor? And I said, the best time ever to be a mayor, 1976, is a centennial year. So we had ribbon cuttings and we had candidates coming through. Uh, at that time, Gerald Ford was the president and he came through and spoke in Lafayette or in, in Walnut Creek. And uh, all of us local mayors were up on the podium with him. And so I always so tell people that I have shook the hand of a president. <laughs> yes, you have. And you were a president. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to kind of wrap that all up, I only, ran, only stayed on the council for one term. And eventually when I was getting off of the, of the council, <laughs> uh, Lou Rapetto was the head of the historical society, which had been formed a year, a couple of years before that. And he said, uh, you know, what we really ought to do is to make sure that the past presidents or past uh, mayors should be on the board of the historical society. And so I became a member of the historical society uh, on the board. And uh, I guess I'm one of those, as my wife always said, you, your problem is 
you just don't know how to say no. <laughs> so eventually, um, and I've been on the board with the Historical Society since 1978, let's say. It's been a long time. So, anything else that you'd like to know about how I got here and why? <laughs> well, we do have a good story from you. <laughs> um, we'd like to know um, something about well, I guess those are your social activities of the Historical mm -hmm. Society and the Improvement Association mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And one of the questions was, but this would probably be in your background, what did you do after school when you were a young person? Mm -hmm. Were you in sports or um, what were you interested in in high school? Well, <laughs> in both in high school and in college, I was on the swimming team, and I, I'm a springboard diver. I was much mm -hmm. slimmer and trimmer <laughs> then than I am now. But uh, on, I was at uh, in the high school uh, swimming team. I was captain of the swimming team. Oh. And uh, at Purdue, I was uh, one of the divers. And in fact, uh, went to the uh, intercollegiates one year at Yale from Indiana. I had a great time driving all the way from Indiana to uh, New Haven. Um, let's see. Uh, well, after that, uh, again, here in Lafayette, we decided our community decided we needed to have a community swimming pool. So we formed Rancho Colorados, and which was just over the next street over from where our home is on Indian Way. And I was involved with the building and formation of Rancho Colorado. So also our son by that time was into Little League Baseball and so I got involved with the Little League Baseball activities. And let's see what else. That's, a, that is That's about school. <laughs> <laughs> what about your holidays? Are there any uh, special celebrations uh, as a child growing up or even now that you um, so, what well, you do celebrate? <laughs> well, um, uh, let's say back in Pennsylvania, of course, we always had, uh, in fact, we even called it Declaration Day, which is now called Memorial Day, mm -hmm. and uh, used to get your bicycles all decorated, and there would be a local parade, and so we'd have those things. Of course, Fourth of July was always a big time. Um, during the uh, winter season, or football season, uh, I was a cheerleader in the high school. You were a cheerleader. <laughs> and anyway, uh, there were times when you play a football game in Pennsylvania when it still is plenty cold, like the the big game with our arch rival, which was the near but nearest uh, township, was always played on Thanksgiving Day, and sometimes the field would be frozen, <laughs> which was no fun, but. At that time, incidentally, the high schools always played their games on Thanksgiving Day, but the University of Pennsylvania always played Col no, uh, Cornell always on on uh, Thanksgiving Day, and so people would go to the high school game in the morning and then go to, into Philadelphia to see Penn and Cornell play in the afternoon. Uh, let's see. So you usually had snow for your holiday. Yeah, well, yeah. well, we had <laughs> snow, yes. <laughs> but not here in Lafayette. <laughs> well, we've had snow here in Lafayette. And but not during Christmas, probably. <laughs> no, but no. But there have been times, back one time, my wife was down shopping here in the Safeway store, and they all looked out the window, and it was snowing, and it was just beginning to make a little crust on the street. And by the time she got home, she made tracks up our driveway trying to get up to the house. So we do get some snow. I people. remember the one time in April. Yeah, it happens. It happens. People yes. remember when it snows around here because it's so rare. <laughs> yeah. That's when they take a picture, mm -hmm. and yeah. especially in the old <laughs> days, it was an occasion for yeah. that. Well, one of the other things in, in around uh, eastern Pennsylvania, for instance, the, the uh, U.S. Uh, golf open uh, tournament was played at Marion Golf Club which was nearby where I lived. And I used to caddy there, and we used to do our snow skiing and, and um, sledding on the hills in the Marion Golf Club. So it was a great place to, uh, nice open fairways that you could do a long ride on. 
<laughs> well, there have been a lot of changes when you first came here and, uh, and what it is now. Mm, what would you change, if possible? I know you're pleased with Lafayette. <laughs> You've contributed so much well, to its development. I guess the, the, the thing that really needs to change in this whole area is that we got to flatten out some of the hills, only because there, our problem in all of the community here is that Lafayette is in a valley and hills all around it, and the nearby community of Moraga or Pleasant Hill or Walnut Creek are all have to come into Lafayette to get either to Oakland or to get to what is now 680 to get further south. And the worst thing that we ever that happens is that we just don't have enough through streets. You can't get from Moraga to Walnut Creek or to Oakland without going through Lafayette or Orinda. And um, at one time, there was a proposal for a freeway that was supposed to come from Richmond all the way through and through Burton Valley and through over uh, the, the hills back there to get to Alamo or Danville. And there was also a freeway that was called the Shepherd Canyon Freeway, which was to come from Park Boulevard in, in uh, Oakland and then down through Moraga and come out and eventually get to Martinez. Through the canyon area. Yeah, through canyon. And they were beautiful places to go through, very difficult to build a road, and eventually they never did get built for many reasons, their funding and <clears throat> the difficulty of building them. But without those roads, all of the traffic, again from Moraga and Canyon, that area, has to come through Lafayette or Arinda to get someplace. So the, the worst pro problem we have in Lafayette is, as example today, when you start doing road work on Moraga Road, anywhere near the corner with Mount Diablo Boulevard, you're going to tie up an awful lot of cars. There's just no way to avoid it. Well, what, what would uh, you say is the best that remains? The best that the remains? The best that remains in Lafayette. <laughs> well, I think uh, the best that remains is that we did not build roadways or cut down the hillsides. We still have all of our hillsides, and with very careful uh, control over hillside construction, we haven't fill them all up with uh, little dinky houses climbing up the hillsides. So you get out to our area, Burton Valley, and there's all a lot of homes in the valley, but nothing going up, mostly going up the hills. And the same with Happy Valley and Spring Hill. If you, you just make sure that houses are down so they don't d destroy the, the hillside appearances. We built our current home actually on a little knoll in, in uh, Burton Valley with a beautiful view of all of Lafayette. And when we were building the house, in fact, before we built the house, Burton Valley was, was really just a walnut and pear orchard area. And what our first home was, is in, was on Michael Lane. <coughs> and uh, our, for instance, my wife would walk the kids to school through a walnut orchard. And on the way back, she in the fall, she picked walnuts. <laughs> that seems to be a common thread of uh, people who lived um, at that time in the 20s, 30s, yeah. 40s, almost into the 50s, mm -hmm. that um, when they were kids, they would be uh, picking walnuts and pears and the like from the mm -hmm. orchards that were around here. Yeah. Well, you uh, you asked what we did on vacations and things. One of the people, we, we were active with a group of people who actually, they the center of it was a Lafayette Escadrille swear dance group. And we used to go camping always two weeks in the end of July and August. But one of the guys in that group, uh, uh, Les Johnson, his home was on Las Huertas, just off of St. Mary's Road. And he said, and he, you know, I don't think he was born in Lafayette, but he grew up here. And he said at that, when he was a teenager, he used to work for the people that owned those walnut orchards out there. They, he would drive a tractor or do things like that. That area, his house, and the old Oliveira house, which was one of the worker owners of some of the property, and the Burton Ranch house were the three houses 
off of St. Mary's, out of St. Mary's and out through that area. All the rest of that is sometime after 19, well, let's say 1940 or something like that. And most of that was still very much a, just a walnut and pear orchard area. So you were a camper and a dancer, <laughs> <laughs> a man of many talents, well, I would say. Well, but uh, your civic yeah. interests are uh, <laughs> yeah. a special. We, uh, the, well, one of the guys in that uh, group was always, he was all, uh, traveling around for various business reasons, and we'd always try to go to a different place every year. And we went to Big Sur, and we went to Shasta, and we went to Pinecrest, and we went lots of other places. But uh, one of the trips, we were at Shasta in a group campsite, and there was uh, probably 20 families, all in tents. And during the night, the bears came in. <laughs> and my wife said, if we go camping again, you got to get me up off of the ground. I'm not going <laughs> to. So we eventually acquired a trailer, various different kinds of trailers. And one of the last things that we found was uh, the same guy was coming through up near Chester at Lake Almanor, and he said that would be a great place. And he found a campsite in Greenville, which is just it, which it says that it's near Lake Almanor. Well, it turns out about five miles away from the lake. But eventually, we found our a campsite in uh, at Lake Almanor, and this would be about 1968 or nine or something like that. And we never went any other places after that. <laughs> the whole group uh, eventually that campsite got. As many things happened, they decided they would build a bunch of condominiums on the lake, and so our campsite was gone. Did you do fishing, and is that what you're well, doing when you're camping? I'm not much of a fisherman. cooking no. or what? You I, just were well, enjoying the... Well, the important thing, uh, at wilderness. Lake Almanor, there are two golf courses. At that time, there are now three, and um, I like to golf. So one of the other guys liked to go fishing, and what we always did to do a lot of things, swimming and boating during the daytime. And then promptly at 5 o'clock, we'd have happy hour, and all of the adults would decide to get together and tell about what they'd done during the day. And so I asked the guy who went fishing, I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I was took about five hours worth of fishing, and he was stream fishing. And I said, did you catch anything? He said, no, I didn't. He said, George, what did you do? And I said, I played golf, and he said, well, how long did you play golf? I said, about five hours. Well, okay, so some people like to go fishing for five hours. Some people prefer to play golf for five hours. <laughs> but we had at one time, um, as my wife used to say, there were 14, 14 year old kids in that group, all at Lake Albanard. One family had four girls, another family had four boys or three boys, you know, it was a whole bunch of teenagers, and which makes a, a nice little campground. The owners of that campground were originally from Marinda, and uh, when we first arrived there, they said, well, we said, we'd like to come in with a group, and they said, no, 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 no more groups. We had a group of motorcycle people here last week, mm -hmm. and we don't want to have that in, and we uh, insisted that convincing them that we were really quite respectable people from Lafayette and we did not have motorcycles or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so they agreed to let us, and we stayed there for about 30 years. Oh, right? my goodness. Yeah. This is almost like a, an extended family. Yes, it was. And, and, uh, uh, and, and they had, and they had two, twin daughters and a son, two boys and two girls, and they were all in that same age group. So that it... Yeah. Uh, made for a nice community. Good memories. Yeah. Um, during your um, years of uh, public service, uh, both with the city and then before with mm -hmm. the um, uh, improvers, uh, can you tell us about uh, some incidents that you think uh, uh, that were challenging, that, uh, that you accepted mm -hmm. the challenge and, uh, and uh, how you uh, overcame them or, mm -hmm. or, or not? Well, well, I think, for instance, it, with the, the Lafayette Improvement Association was, you know, formed when 
town hall is built in 1914. And it was originally a part of what was then called Lafayette Improvers Association or something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> we, in order to do any planning for the city in Lafayette, you had to go to Martinez. And that was always the problem. You, it, someday somebody would plan a subdivision or something like that, and we'd have to go all the way to Martinez. Not that it was a long way, but it just, it's the county, and they had lots of things going in the county, so you never got immediate attention. And, and that was really the drive of really why Lafayette decided to incorporate. We wanted to have local control over mm -hmm. things because at that time, you know, they could, somebody would come in and buy 20 or 30 acres of land and decide they were going to do a big subdivision. Not that they were not good subdivisions, but they were a whole lot smaller lots and things of that sort. Not, and not that you have to have a big lot, but it just was a lot of outside control mm -hmm. rather than, it's and, and the same way with roads and things. If you needed something done on the roads, you had to go to Martinez to, to the traffic commissions or those mm -hmm. kind of people in order to get something done. Mm -hmm. So the important thing about uh, Improvement Association was that we were able to kind of make a good name for ourselves. We had a good concept of what Lafayette ought to be, and we did not want to be just another um, building of all kinds of different things. So it um, worked out very well. On the, on the city council, again, forming uh, from the very beginning, getting a general plan for the city was a big chore for the first city council. And this first and second, I was on the third city council. But the, uh, the fact is that you've got a lot of things to do. And m most of the people had, had, like me, no experience at all with being a part of a municipal <coughs> A business or corporation or, or whatever it might be. We were fortunate enough to get Ernie Mariner as our first city manager and uh, he led the city councils through an awful lot of improvements over the years. But again, the biggest challenge has always been, well, for example, when, when Lafayette was first incorporated, I think there were like six or eight gasoline stations on Mount Diablo Boulevard. And each one of them had a big sign, or two signs, and all the everybody around had big signs. And the city council and the city decided, we don't want to have that. They had no objection to the service stations, but they did not want to have a whole bunch of signs all over the place. So first thing they did was form a sign commission, and we started enforcing the sizes and the kinds of signs that you would have. And for example, they... Uh, for instance, the Chevron station at Happy Valley Road and, and uh, Mount Diablo Boulevard, <coughs> their signs were bigger than what the city was proposing. And they said, well, uh, no, we have this size sign. And the city said, you can have that size sign if you'd like, but you're not going to put it in Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> and the same with 76 or Amico or whoever it might be. Everybody had to have the signs down low, mm -hmm and a appropriate size. That was so, a big improvement. It, so. has, it sure makes a difference. I, I, and, uh, and a lot of the landscaping on Mount Diablo Boulevard has made a much great, much better difference. In fact, before the high of the 24 was built, uh, I commuted to San Francisco and on the Greyhound bus, mm -hmm. and everybody came right down from if you came through the tunnel, came down through Arenda, and you wound around through the Arenda, <coughs> past the theater, out onto Mount Diablo Boulevard, and again down into Lafayette, and all the way to Walnut Creek. And it was just a chore. <laughs> Not that it's, it's got more traffic on it today, and I think it did then, but it sure is um, not bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic mm -hmm. all day long. Mm -hmm. So I think traffic uh, it, and is one of the serious problems that uh, the city faces. And, and parking, when I got onto the commission or onto the city council, I decided we really ought to do something about parking. So I, one of my uh, campaign 
those things was to form a parking commission. And so we did. We haven't produced a whole lot of parkings, but we <laughs> <laughs> at least established, we did a, a survey to see how many parking places were needed and how many we had. And needless to say, we came up woefully short with parking, and it still is a serious problem today, just as soon as you start doing some repair work on the street. It's interesting that Lafayette has no dedicated parking structure the way, say, in Walnut Creek. Yeah. Well, and when you think about that, uh, for instance, the, one of the recent discussions has been in, increasing a building back in what's called the, we used to call it the BART block, but it's Lafayette area. And the people on, on the other side, uh, which would be south of um, Mount Diablo Boulevard, were objecting because that would uh, impede their view to the hillsides above them. All right, so where would you put a parking? Well, probably on top of Diablo Foods and what is now uh, CVS Pharmacy and all that. Now you build a structure, and the people on the other side, mm -hmm. south, would begin to say, you can't do that. Now you're taking all of our view. So unless you put the parking underground, uh, there's really no, no place to put it. And, and in fact, uh, well, if, if for example, where McCullough's is, you may remember <clears throat> that was a hillside, and they graded that all out, and put in McCullough's and, and the Safeway store, and now Whole Foods and lots of other things. But people don't realize that at one time that was a big hill, and all of that stuff was graded out of there and hauled off toward Martinez. I have the solution much smaller cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll work too. <laughs> and speaking of cars or vehicles, we want to know more about your association with old Betsy. Okay. And mm -hmm. well, when, when you first, uh, mm -hmm. you know, became an involved. Yeah. Well, okay. going back a whole lot, <clears throat> one of my very, very close friends that uh, kind of grew up in our family back in, in Pennsylvania, acquired a Model T Ford when we were still in high school. Ooh. And uh, we did a lot of things with that. Drove it around lots of places. In fact, took a trip from his grandparents owned a place in Ocean City, New Jersey. And we went from Ocean City, New Jersey with the Model T Ford up to the New York World's Fair in 1939 or 40 or something like that. We had, uh, oh, I think, on the total trip, we had 23 flat tires, and the car broke down a couple of times. But you can fix a Model T in great uh, hurry. The, the reason I say that is that when all of a sudden John Callio, I had I a long time said that um, um, Tony Lodges was the one that found old Betsy in a, in a kind of a junkyard out in Pleasant Hill, but it was John Callio who found it. And it was suggested that it was Lafayette's original, the first motorized fire engine, <clears throat> and uh, we really ought to acquire it. And so I was on the council at that time, and we said, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. And somebody said, well, yeah, but who's going to drive it? And I said, well, I owned a Model T when I was a teenager, and I know how to drive it. And so that, when the city acquired it, I then became the driver and um, enjoy it very much. And oh, for 30 years we had it in our garage while it was being refurbished, and now it's here in this library building, <clears throat> which is, makes it very visible, and at least I can get two cars in the two-car garage now. <laughs> but my association with it was, again, that as a teenager I owned a Model T and knew some things about it, and fortunately a Model T is a, <coughs> a car that... Um, an engine and a body and style that you you really can't kill it. It it will work. You can you can get parts for it, all kinds of things, and it'll keep running forever and ever and ever wow. and ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty much indestructible. Yes, until you run it into a tree or down <laughs> a canyon. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have planned obsolescence back then. Well, that's interesting in that regard. You know, Henry Ford just came out with that Model T in uh, 1908, and uh, 
They built a whole lot of them, and it was being built until 1928 when they finally built the Model, model, a. Uh, model a. But up until then, these were all Model T's. And um, in fact, right now, <coughs> those engines, the, the Model T engine, is used to r drive pumps in a lot of farm areas to siphon water out of canals. South America, there's an awful lot of Model T engines still running. And again, because you can buy parts for them, and it's pretty easy to take it apart and put it back together again. Mm -hmm. At least you can get underneath it. With a modern day car, you, these little cars that you're talking about, you can't even get underneath it, let alone do any work under there. Mm -hmm. no computer controlled and you have to have a lot <laughs> yeah, of right. sophisticated yes. diagnostic equipment to know yes. what's going on. Mm -hmm. well, that was a real pleasure for you there, wasn't it? Well, yes, I, I enjoyed it very much and, the, and you know, we go to parades and you get to wave at people and people riding in the back and waving flags. Children <coughs> it's, love it's, that. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. but, um, and, the, and there are still people here in Lafayette that Remember when it was a part of the Lafayette, then Lafayette Fire District, mm -hmm. which was a volunteer organization, really. But um, they're beginning to disappear as well, mm -hmm. as with everything else. But the Model T will continue on forever and ever. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you need to turn it? Well, one of the things that I always say is, that, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I can remember in high school when you had to make a five-minute speech or something, and it just seemed like you could never do that. Uh, how could you talk for five minutes? I always tell people, nowadays, just give me a chance. I can talk forever and ever and ever. <laughs> uh, so, and in that regard, for instance, I, uh, I'm a patent attorney that makes the combination of engineering and law together. And I worked for Chevron for many, many years before I retired. And I've been active with helping inventors along the way, trying to keep them from wasting their money doing things with patents. And it's always fun to watch a city like this grow and watch inventors grow and watch, well, and watch this building that we're in here. When you consider that the old original Veterans Hall was really a, not a very attractive place, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this building here is such a wonderful addition to the city and has so many, many things that go on here, including this activity of the Historical Society, it's, uh, it, I think the city has done a lot of very good things. And I think our planning and the members of the city council over the years have been very diligent about keeping it in a, we had originally called it a semi-rural community. Well, it's not that at all, but at least it is not 35 stories, buildings all over the place. The concept was to keep it into a residential community where people who lived here could enjoy the community and all the activities that we do here and you know we've got baseballs and little league and soccer you on the fall you you've got kids playing on every field there is that's available because um, there's just always something to do right here mm -hmm. your children you said you had um how many we have three days? we had three children our first was a son uh, <laughs> incidentally First thing he ever wanted, and last thing, when he was getting out of high school, he, he wanted to get into law enforcement. So he managed to get on as a cadet in the Concord Police Department, just out of high school. And as a result, 30 plus years later, he's retired from the Concord Police Department. He was their sergeant of police, that which is the highest level of, of uh, sergeants that they have. And he's been retired for, he retired at age 50. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a pretty tough life. <laughs> and then we have two daughters. One, our oldest daughter is a hairstylist. She has a shop out in Clayton, lives in Concord. She has uh, 
a son and a daughter, and uh, the son is about, or the daughter is about ready, no, the son is about ready to get married sometime next year. Mm -hmm. And our other daughter, the youngest daughter, as it lives again in Concord, she has three children. Uh, two of them are through high school. One is at Chico, one is uh, still going to DVC, and <coughs> our, our youngest is a grandson, and he's about ready to graduate from Concord High School. And we have two great grandchildren, so we we're creating a population in Contra Costa County. <laughs> Do you still go camping together, all of the family? Well, <laughs> yes and no. I, we, I'm selling our trailer now, but uh, as I say, our son is up at Lake Almanor, and that's where we had always gone. And so I will maybe take this trailer before I sell it and go up there for a week or something of that sort. The difficulty is getting there and getting the, the trailer all set up. It used to be great fun when you come in, set your trailer up for two weeks, and then you didn't move it again until you got ready to leave. We've taken that trailer back and forth across the country many times, one night here, there, one night there. <laughs> we've been to lots of places. Across the country? Oh, yes. We've, we, one trip, uh, we went all the way to uh, Nova Scotia, and then on the way back, we came up into Canada out of Minnesota at Duluth, and then went all the way across southern Canada to Vancouver and then back down again. So it's been a lot of places. You certainly had a full life, haven't you? Well, <laughs> I figure you don't want to just sit and watch the trees grow and things like that. you got to keep up, be busy doing things.